So thanks a lot for being here and thanks to all the people that are online. So today we welcome uh, Luca Nogunet, who is a professor in uh, computer science here in Helsinki, who will tell us about challenges in machine learning engineering. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot and welcome. Happy to see so many people in the room and also, also here in the room. Yeah, so ML engineering is the topic that I've been working now here since the four years that I, after I started here mostly. And um, the story I'm going to tell today is sort of maybe three parts. First of all, try to tell you a bit why you should care about ML engineering. Maybe you already do care, and that's the reason why you are here. Uh, then I show two examples of our research. One about this sort of more of the engineering side of the story, the kind of holistic um, ML engineering approach. And then the other one kind of very detailed, more to the data science direction point of view, going to the monitoring um, and uncertainty calibration in the machine learning, learning models. So that's, that's the plan to cover. And ML engineering. So um, I guess people know software engineering at some level. We have been, or people have been the past 70 years trying to make software engineering better so that the systems would be more reliable, better produced in budget, uh, wouldn't have mistakes, would be scalable, all these good goals. And um, that has taken a while, and I guess there's still many of things wrong. But it's it's pretty good. Now, the question is that when this machine learning enters the picture, how does this change the software engineering? Can we just use the same software engineering approaches in the past? Um, are the same, say, testing approaches, maintenance approaches still valid? The answer is probably not. So uh, maintenance is rather different if you just retrain the model or if you do some code change. Testing, in principle, I guess in classical software, you assume that everything should go right. In machine learning model, we know that maybe 2% or 1% or whatever percent will go wrong. That's part of the nature of the machine learning models. So things change in a way. And the question is that how we now in this new era, when the machine learning components enter the picture, how we should deal with them, how to develop, test, deploy, monitor, maintain all that. And um, of course, the key thing is that the machine learning things rely very heavily on the data. And the data is something that, of course, the classical software systems also deal with data, but maybe the uh, role of data is a bit different in them because it's processing data, while in machine learning systems, data is an essential building block of this whole thing. And this picture sort of tries to tell a bit of the shift uh, of, of the story in a way that uh, a lot of data science, machine learning, uh, lives in this side of cycle in a way that you try to get the data, you somehow modify the data, then you train the model and you evaluate the model. And that is of course okay, as long as you are just working with the model. But the model is not alone. There's hardly any shifts and there's, there's only the machine learning model. There's always all kinds of other software also um, around it. And um, once you are in this sort of maybe development cycle of the model, um, after things are already there, then you need to take the steps that you product, product, you analyze the model, start work. Um, meaning that you need to make sure that it runs in some kind of scalable fashion. It may have thousands of users in a minute. Uh, you should do that in a cost efficient way. Um, in a scalable way that uh, when there's lots of users, you are still able to serve them. When there's few users, you want to place the resources to be ready to serve them. Um, 
to make predictions. Um, you should monitor how the model is doing, that you know if things are wrong. Some of the things are the old measures, like what's the latency of the model response time. But then there are these new measures, like uh, the quality of the predictions that the model is giving you. In some cases, uh, we never know if the model gave the right answer, but there's quite a few cases where you know that was the model giving you a good answer. In the stock markets, for example, you know it maybe the next day. Uh, in energy forecasting, you, you know it also maybe on our or day day level. Uh, in some recommendation system, you know maybe after a few minutes that if the customer click the links and make the purchase that was suggested as well. And then you gather the insights and uh, sort of then maybe change a bit the business needs that then influence what you, what what the model is supposed to do more, what, what what's the future of your model. So, so that's the shift in a way, looking not just the model itself, but looking at the big picture, both on this uh, life cycle steps point of view. It's not the first development that matters, but actually the continuous development that matters. And looking at the integration of these models to the classical software systems. Sorry that this is in Finnish, but uh, it was in Finnish, so I just copied it without bothering to translate. But this tells, I guess, some of the difficulties that is there that this machine learning is a bit of this kind of handcraft industry that everybody does their own experimentation in their own way. And uh, it's not this type of uh, very systematic and repeatable. And then after you have played with the model for a few weeks, you may not remember anymore what you did a few weeks earlier. You remember you might have gotten actually one similar result or quite good result. And then once the model is there, really bringing it to the production is the, is the key. And um, the left-hand side, the pipe shot, I guess there is telling the story in a way that the machine learning uh, models are typically part of the product or a service. So they are not alone. So they have to be there. And the software where they are part of evolves with the own software evolution rules, software maintenance rules, software testing rules, and then the machine learning model evolves with its own ways and how to kind of make these two words in a way work together is among those challenges. And now my idea was that to illustrate a bit of the work we have been doing on this area, which is actually quite a lot because we have quite big team and quite many projects on this, I, I picked sort of two examples. And the first example is about this open source uh, pipeline for continuous training and deployment. And the key thing where we, I guess, are most excited about it research-wise is that we are trying this sort of autonomous approach. So creating so uh, automatic system that it is able to detect when it needs uh, to retrain itself, is able to do that automatically and then sort of deploy and test and do all those things. So that in principle, you once you have deployed the system, it should run without any human involvement for, for weeks or months or years in the best case. I guess the reality is that maybe it's not so, so easy to do that in real life, but. But in principle, that's the, that's the idea here. Um, yeah, continuing from this theme that somehow we are on this handcraft business, on this manual way of doing things pretty much now. This is some kind of stepwise model how you should increase the level of automation and get some kind of uh, standardized way of uh, working aiming for the automated way, the middle step there where the ML workflow is pretty much automated. And then the two further steps maybe bring more the perspective of this, how you combine the machine learning workflows and the 
continuous uh, software development processes. And in this work, I guess we are aiming more to be there on this uh, sort of middle step. We are focused on this machine learning workflows rather than on the integration of the classical app and the machine learning code that much. And the system, well, it has this type of cryptic name, CPCTE, continuous uh, training, continuous deployment, experimentation. That I was telling you. That's the explanation of this cryptic name. But basically, what it does is that it supports all the steps in the life cycle. So, the data engineering, the model training and deployment, model serving, model monitoring, and then the feedback loop. Um, once the monitoring finds out that something is strange, back to the training and deployment to uh, kind of create an update with a better model. Um, often, the machine learning models in the industry are trained on some kind of calendar based way that once a week there's a new training round that's done. And that, of course, is a practical way, but it might also be a pretty wasteful way. Sometimes you just train without the need for that. And sometimes that period might be actually too long. If there's something very rapidly changing in the world. So the idea would be to detect when you need to train and then trigger that automatically. Once the model is trained and done all of this, uh, Typical tests that are done for the model comes the deployment, putting it typically to the cloud, uh, available for uh, to provide the service. Then comes this A-B testing, which is, I guess, pretty common in the different uh, web services. And what that means is that uh, part of the customers are sort of uh, rooted to the new version of the solution and the rest are still using the old one. And that's sort of the experimentation way in a way to see how the new deals with the other. And there's different sort of ways how you typically do that. You can just start cutting sort of X percent of the users to the new one and then you increase the percent if things are fine. Or you might run both together in parallel and see how they work differently and uh, so on. But the key idea there is to kind of ensure that the new system works well enough that you can then someday switch all the traffic to the new system. And this is pretty established in the classical software side and I guess it's also increasing there right like now on the machine learning one and stuff. You can, you can test it in different conditions. Versioning of software, I guess we all know maybe how to use Git and that kind of uh, version control systems for classical software. With the machine learning comes the questions of how you version the data, uh, how you will remember which data you use to train the model that you are using. Uh, you might have the old models. Uh, that you want to revert back to if the new model is not working nicely. Or, for example, you may want to revert back to the April, to the model of last April, because that actually worked better in the conditions that we have in the month of April. It depends on weather or that kind of conditions. So, so this thing that you have way to know what models uh, you have trained what has been their performance, what data did you use to train them. All of this requires pretty complicated bookkeeping, especially in case there's a lot of data that you can't really just replicate that all the time, but do something clever. And the solution we've developed sort of relies on open source components, um, most of them something that are available and used, some of them missing, which we then implemented ourselves there. Everything runs on top of Kubernetes, so it should be very easy to deploy. 
whatever you want. One of the ideas being that a lot of the cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and so on, have some kind of support for this kind of you know, box pipelines. But then you have this uh, vendor locking problem that you can't easily switch over. And then they, they might have some, some limitations. So, so this is the this is the thinking in a way that if everything open source everything, so Kubernetes then deploying and moving from one cloud to another, and uh, then replacing one open source component with a better one. It's also a physical option for you. And this is the, the picture. So maybe this is not very easy to get, get the first glance, but maybe we start here. This is the model down here. And uh, you have sort of trained the model here um, and stored the model in a model registry. Then you put the model to this serving platform, uh, use the tools for A-B testing, which control that how much traffic is put to that, uh, collect the results of the A-B testing, uh, how, how well it beha behaves, so for that, you need the monitoring that sort of gets what input did the model get, what result did the model uh, give, what was the inference result of the model, and then maybe also that what is the ground truth that was that really the right, right result that the model gave. The ground truth often comes with some delay, so it's not immediately there, but with some delay, you might have it. And with that, you then try to understand the model performance and in case of A-B testing that influences how rapidly you increase the uh, volume of the new model maybe, or whether you want to roll back to the old model if the new model starts to show that bad behavior. And then more excitingly, maybe this direction here that uh, if the model performance is bad, then the retraining trigger will fire and sort of that cause the system to uh, retrain with the assumption that new data has been accumulated or, or something during that time. Then comes all kinds of questions that what kind of data should you use for that retraining that you take everything that you had, you take some sliding window of the latest week or do you have some, some clever method? That's, that's one of the key, key issues also in the study focus. And this is the actual, so I guess you don't see much of the names there, but there's all kinds of things. The blue ones are the ones that we have done ourselves. The, the, the non-blue ones are the ones that we are just picked as open source. Somewhere. So I guess what you can learn from just by just looking at the colors is that a lot of things are kind of ready as open source. It's just that you need to take them and start using them in some kind of uh, good way. And this, I don't know if you are able to read this very well, but this was one of the experiments, uh, quite early experiment that. How how does the how is this able to adapt if the data if we have a data shift? So then then we have this sort of a sinus curve. It was forecasting okay what are the next points coming. So that's relatively easy to forecast. So up here it's almost uh, uh, almost perfect. So the the forecast then. Uh, we have got to go to this point where here the uh, function changes that it's no longer sinus x, but it's sinus x plus one. And of course, then our forecast, uh, our model starts to do very bad work. Until then, the trigger happens that, okay, now train the model, train a new model, and then here, the new model has taken into use and we are back again to the, to the good behavior. So, so the experiments are still undergoing in a way with a bit more fancier functions than this very simple one, but it seems to kind of indicate that 
it's kind of able to react and recover by creating a new metamora. And yeah, some, some of the things I already mentioned is that somehow the ground rule is very different depending on the use case. Sometimes it's delayed, sometimes it's very uncertain how you deal with that. Address holding when, what, what should be the limit when you go back to the training, how often, how, how sensitive that should be with that. And then especially the selection of the retraining data is one of the issues. And then things are easy when you do it, do this all on the cloud. But then if you have the edge there as well, then the jump from the cloud to the edge is a bit sort of bigger step. And uh, how, how to sort of extend all this thinking that we have here to those solutions where the model is then running on the edge device in mobile phone or some IoT device. So that was the first part of the story. And the second part of the story now jumps to a very different direction. So now takes the very strong statistics, data science direction and starts looking at confidence calibration and monitoring. So one of the boxes or one part of, of the box is that the previous one had. And this is the typical thing, I guess, that we have this sort of in the whole entity thing, in the pipeline, we have a lot of these boxes. But then when you start looking at how one box should operate, you come into all kinds of fancy data science problems that are sometimes even fancier than the actual model. Because the models are actually pretty, maybe this is a strong statement, but the models are pretty okay. There's all these libraries which have good codes for the models. So you just pick the model from there. But many of the other parts of this pipeline are Actually, maybe more exciting and challenging to get, get right than the model itself. And um, the basic thing, maybe we skip this, uh, or let, let's say this this is a bus where it's a Finnish company that does this kind of uh, uh, automatic billing. So the bill, an invoice, has all kinds of fields, the, the price of the thing and the tax percentage and that kind of things. And their business is sort of to deal with them. And um, OK, there's electronic billing when things are easy, but then there's the manual billing. A lot of things is still kind of manual. So you have a picture of the bill, so something like that. And you should find out from there that what is the total, what is the tax percent, and that kind of things. Each company tends to have a different way how the bills look like. And uh, the challenge that this bus where our, our partner in one of the programs has is that they have two options. They can put this bill to the manual handling. Then some people in India or somewhere do it. That of course costs money or they can try to do it automatically. Um, they have a pretty nice system which does this sort of uh, automatic detection of these things. Um, it tells also the certainty in a way or something about the certainty of the estimate, how likely, how, how, how strongly it believes that this, for example, field there is the total of that invoice. Yeah, that's a good question. Why is it, it non-trivial to calculate the tax and the sum? So calculating is easy, but if you just have this bill as a graphical thing, ah. so, so knowing that what these numbers mean, this is the difficulty. So I guess you can detect these numbers with also all, all these kind of things. But knowing that what this number means, if it's an English language bill, the word gives you strong indications, I guess, total in US dollars. But if that is in uh, Taiwanese, in, in Korean language, or just pick any Indian language or whatever language, uh, it's much more challenging problem. Did I, did yeah. I get, yeah. And 
And the challenge here is that somehow the confidence is now here very important that you should be able to make a decision that, okay, I only send these bills to the manual invoicing if I'm, uh, if there's more than 20% uncertainty or 10% uncertainty, something like that. And now in order to be able to do that kind of rational decision, the problem is that you should then know really how good is the confidence that your model is given. And this is what we mean with model calibration, that if the model, I guess the weather forecast example is good, if the forecaster predicts that the probability that the, it will rain with 90% confidence, then it actually will rain 90% of the time that that kind of uh, forecast has been set. But the machine learning models don't work like that. So typical neural network models, like this uncalibrated one here, has pretty big difference between the confidence number that it gives and the actual confidence when you look at the statistics, how, how frequently that happened. And this is the essence of this work in a way that how can we calibrate the model so that we get from this uncalibrated one to the as perfectly calibrated one as possible, which would be this uh, sort of dotted line over here, that that would be perfectly calibrated, that the confidence percent that was forecasted was exactly the statistical thing that uh, what then happened in, in the in the long run, in the in the window that you are looking at. Um, there's different ways to do this calibration. Um, these are existing the calibration, blood scaling, all kinds of ways. And, and these number pictures show somehow how, how they are not, not very good. So um, if you are looking at that here on the right hand side, it's claiming that it's very confident. And there's quite a big number of cases in the data set where it's uh, forecasting incorrectly, even if it's claiming to be 100% correct. And then of course, there's other similar things on the other side that it's actually, it is correct, but it's still uh, feeling that it's very hesitant, not, not at all confident that it's correct. So the ideal case would be that we would be able to split these, that all the correct ones would be there on the right-hand side with very strong confidence and all the incorrectly forecasted would be there with on the left-hand side with very low confidence. And this is partly a calibration issue, how, how you do it. But the problem with calibration is that it tends to sort of uh, put these uh, bars kind of higher and lower in equal ratio with all. So, so what we need in addition to that is that we would like to increase the separation in a way so that the right ones goes further to the right and the incorrect ones goes further to the left. Uh, so that the separation would be as good as possible. And, uh, okay. Here's the system. This is more or less, I guess, up to this, the, the existing system that the company has for sort of uh, getting these so-called heat maps which tell the, where a certain field is uh, using uh, 3D convolutional networks to, uh, uh, to estimate that and then also give the estimate that is it correct or what is the probability, or what is the confidence that it thinks it's correct or, or not correct. And now the new addition, based on our work by this uh, uh, Johanni Kivimäki, who's one of the doctoral students in our team, is that he built this uh, confidence calculator um, 
calibration model and the combination of those two uh, results into this calibrated confidence. Confidence calculator aims to split these uh, correct and incorrect things further from each other. XG boost algorithm is there. And then once that is done, then the calibration model tries to do the calibration to get them match the statistical likelihood as well as possible. And well, it works reasonably well. This is the splitting thing in a way that this is one, one experiment, not as much data as in this that I showed previously, but there is uh, the case, the confidence is not very high. There's actually nothing with very high confidence here. And then on the right hand picture, you can see that, okay, it splits pretty well the correctly forecasted with rather high confidence to the right hand side and the incorrect ones, kind of okay to the left hand side. But of course, there are still these cases here 0 0.8 confidence, and still it's incorrect estimates, so it's not. Not perfect, but, but better at the starting point. And then this is the following calibration step. So after that is done, then the calibration on top of that, you get actually pretty nice, nice thing. So this zero line would be the perfect. As we can see, it's kind of okay. And the benefit of, of this is that now, if this now allows you to kind of know very accurately what is the confidence, then you can do this kind of more rational decision making that you can do a business decision that, okay, we can afford to have 5% of the cases wrong and then get angry customers calling us. And then you can use all these tools of the uh, probability calculation. Like if you have multiple models, uh, do working together, you can combine all these things with the regular rules of probability calculation. And all these things then start to work pretty nicely here. And one more thing that is currently now studied on this is uh, this thing that um, um, can we use this kind of approaches also for monitoring? So can we use this similar approaches to know that, okay, now the model is not working correctly. And monitoring is kind of easy if you have the right answers available with some delay, but especially the case where you don't have the right answers available. So can you still somehow know that now the model is having difficulties? And the idea here, is to kind of steal something from the statistical process control field, um, where this has been in factories and everywhere for decades. So, so somehow there's some, some process and you have the normal process variation, and then you have these uh, special cases which are outside of that. And now you should be able to detect that if your situation is a blue point, or if your situation is a red point. And the way to do that, uh, okay, there's the mathematical story is long, so I maybe skip the mathematical story. You can look at that on your own if you want. Uh, but the essence of this is that all this mathematical story in this uh, probability distributions uh, allows you to get this. So the assumption is that the calibration, the thing that was done previously, that works. We are able to do perfect calibration or very good calibration anyhow. So assuming the calibration assumption holds, then can we use this to estimate the error rate and the answer is that yes, then we can have this distribution and that distribution allows us to estimate the error rate very nicely. 
So out of 1,000 predictions, we are 95% confident that there are less than 92 errors in, in this picture. And that kind of distribution allows us then again this kind of rational decision making that we can then use this to specify different conditions for triggering the retraining or whatever action we then want to take when the monitoring detects that things are not as they used to be. And here's um, kind of an experiment kind of trying to show uh, that this works. So you have the original data and then you add some kind of data shift where the shift amount five is almost this type of uniform distribution. And the other ones there in the middle are some kind of uh, in between. Um, okay, maybe maybe we shouldn't go to the details, but basically what this shows is that yes, it looks good. The average, the, the mean stays on the zero line very nicely on, on this model. While for example, in this sort of binomial distribution which some people use, start to have pretty strong sort of uh, gap between the optimal way and the calculated way. And this is maybe a better example. There's this kind of tool called NAMI ML, which does this sort of uh, uh, monitoring based on the confidence intervals. And the comparison to that is pretty good from our point of view, this thing. The idea is that this uh, black line on this 95% uh, level is the optimum that you should get. And uh, the many ML is the green one, which at the beginning is clearly too high and only then starts to approach the 95% when you are there on the almost uh, uniform distribution. And our blue line seems to be doing kind of okay there. So, so considering that many ML is the state of the art way, I guess doing this. So I guess this is pretty pretty nice result. So yeah, without access to ground truth, you estimate it through these calibration methods. And of course the different calibration methods then are, are, are or this idea is very sensitive that like how good you are in calibrating. If your calibration is good, you are then using this kind of monitoring as well. Yes, and that's that's about it, maybe what I plan to say. I could advertise this thing if you are interested on Wednesday this week, just happens to be on the same week, all these things. Um, we will have a direct diploma and to an event um, where we sort of show results of some of our projects together with our partners. So that, that's a three hour event that gives a chance to dig a bit deeper to this kind of things than what we are doing here. So, for example, the cost efficient machine learning is one of the exciting things that how can you, uh, the cost of doing this machine learning are really big. Typically, I guess you have read how much it costs to train these large language models. But the surprising thing is that actually running these models can often be the bigger cost than at least some of the partner companies with whom we are working. There, the inference cost is clearly the dominating one. They have lots of lots of queries to their models. And how can we make the model sort of smaller, simpler, proving? Uh, quantification, that, that kind of things. Uh, and and uh, other ways to, to kind of get it. And then of course, this that when you should do certain things, when you should retrain, if you are able to do that in a better, yes, lot of chances to save costs as well. 
but there's other other things than that. But that's one of the exciting things at least for me. That's that's there. But that's it. So thanks from my side, and happy to answer if you have any questions or comments. Is there any question? Uh, um, just uh, maybe kind of in the, in general. Yep. Uh, when the model is formed, then kind of the big question would be then how the data could be improved or why is the model wrong? Is there any kind of insights in, in or to do in that sense or generalization compared to the using kind of like a calibrate? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and it's something we would love to have an answer. <laughs> but I, I think we don't have a very good answer so that we can't go back and point that this is wrong with the data. Uh, and of course, the thing is that it's not a single thing that you can't say that this is the thing that's wrong. Like in the code, you can say that it's this block line, it should be a minus instead of a plus. But here, here the, the problems are much more kind of uh, holistic, or the reasons for the problems are more holistic in a way, that they are some kind of interactions uh, there. Um, it's, it's a thing that we would like to work more and understand more. And one of the things I guess we would like to do is to know that what data should be used for retraining. And there we have maybe two dimensions. We have a big set of data available and we ask that what subset of that would be good. But then we have the other opportunity also, in some cases, for example, in the scientific computation, uh, where you can simulate a lot of things, but it's expensive and slow to simulate. But there's a chance for us to ask that, okay, we would like to have more data of this and that points, this area in more data. Uh, but I, I, I think I don't have an answer and I have a feeling that no one in the world has a really good answer to your question. So it's, it's a very, Good question, an important question. Hopefully, someone gets an answer. Would you learn anything if you've taken like a known bad model, like old model, whatever? Yep. And then use that in kind of to learn something about calibration. Like, or if you take a set of like bad models, known bad models, and known why they are bad, then you kind of would have the yep. front there. Yeah, there, there is opportunity, I guess, that if you have this sort of autonomous uh, ML pipeline like we have, if that would be running for a long time and collecting data, all the models that are there, what are the reasons why they were for retraining? And so on, then you would have sort of a big data set, kind of meta level data set of that model's behavior. And then you would start sort of uh, doing data analytics on that level. That would be one way. Um, the other way, which we have done, but which is not directly what you are saying, is that in one of our activities, we did this kind of thing that tried to look inside the neural network. So neural network is typically a black box, but what uh, was done there was to look at these pairwise activations, that when you trained it, you sort of recorded that which neurons were typically activated together. And then you stored this information. And then during the operation, uh, when you had a data sample coming in, data, data point coming in, then you look that, okay, did you now have some strange neurons firing together that were not happening in the training phase? And that is an indication in a way that, okay, this is now maybe a data sample that might be something new that the network hasn't seen. It might be an indication that that is an area where you haven't had enough training sample. It'd be one way to monitor the network as well that you would use that as a trigger to retrain. How about maybe generate, generating bad models or 
uh, cool models to be kind of really, really cheap. And then at calibration, that, that would be kind of very cheap, very cheap model would be kind of bad model in a way, but could you kind of fix it with the uh, calibration? Yeah, good point. I, I think this pruning and, and all of this cost saving thing, it kind of needs also this data to kind of data. Right? When you prune, you kind of start going down. I guess typically you first go down very slowly and then you mm -hmm. drop. And I guess that is an opportunity to innovate that when that drop happened, which neurons. But, but I guess it's still hard to get back to the data. It's, it's still hard to get back to the data. One of the things which is just, I guess, going on this week is that we have this, in this cost optimal thing, the pruning study found that uh, in some quite big, big model, which wasn't picture, but was more the structure and data, but a lot of parameters, had that it was going down very slowly and then it dropped very dramatically. But after this very dramatic drop, a very small, Further training with a very, very small additional data brought immediately back to the uh, good, good level of performance. But still, the model was at the proof level that you didn't add any new nodes anymore, that it was small, but still back to the original, almost original performance. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in the calibration pipeline, the calibration score or conference scores seem to come from another model, right? And they actually goes to equation yep. things, and then you use the calibration, okay. then you create a calibrator. How frequently would you need to recalibrate a model if it's running, especially for the monitoring kind of um, use case that you mentioned, right? Or is it like a one-time operation? Well, I, I guess it's not a one-time thing. You should recalibrate also that because when the work has changed, you should recalibrate. It's kind of the meta level model that also of course worth change influences that. Uh, so yes, you would need to recalibrate that. How often? Uh, I don't know. You need another monitor to monitor the monitor <laughs> and so on. And you know, so uh, and the theory or the belief maybe is that that should be more solid than the thing you are monitoring. Otherwise, it wouldn't make much sense. And initially, you train that with some data where you know the ground rules that you are able to get it, get it into the air. So then the answer my follow-up question. So for the calibration itself, you need some ground rules then for it to get calibrated. But then you use that calibrated model for the model uh, evaluation or the performance monitoring, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some ground rules is always needed. Yeah. Otherwise, it's... It's a bit like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, there is a question from online asking you if there are recommended open source tools for the open that uh, should be used for ML ops. Say again. Uh, I mean, you can open this chat if you want. Recommendation for open source tools for ML ops. Ah. Okay, so I have them on this slide, which is very hard to read. Um, this is the set that we are using. Um, sorry, it's a bit slow to get back. Here. So basically, maybe you are not able to read it, but um, I. I can maybe start from here in the way we have um, K serve as the inference engine or the infra or as the deployed uh, doing, doing the service. Um, then we have ML flow for tracking um, and keeping a, a track of the model models. So the model registry is in ML flow. Uh, then we have Prometheus from studying the model's uh, functional performance. So meaning this kind of delays and uh, that kind of technical, technical attributes. The monitoring at the model level 
is then kind of our own work that there's no really, or there are some like this Nanny ML and others that are, are options there. Uh, then we have Grafana to, and Prometheus, both of them are a bit sort of visualizing this cell. Uh, or Grafana is more visualizing the monitoring results. And Prometheus has this kind of uh, thresholds and triggers that can create action when some value goes below certain value. And the way we have done it actually is that this monitoring of the model uh, content, how accurate the model is, actually puts all the data to Prometheus and you through that it gets to graph and where you can view it sort of this one. And then we have this iter eight, iter and number eight, which is the tool for the A-B testing. So doing that. And um, what else? Cooper flow pipelines as the basic basic building blocks here. Mean IO as a way to store things. PostgreSQL as kind of metadata, so model training. And that's that's it, I guess that's what we use. Then the blue ones are sort of our own, our own points there. But of course, as I said, these are not the only ones. So there are many other alternatives for this. But in this work, the idea was to pick maybe some kind of best practice tools that we were able to find and which were also reasonably okay to integrate. So there are some tools that are perhaps very good as tools, but they are complicated to integrate. So the idea here was that all of these you could kind of deploy through Kubernetes in, in some kind of very nice way. And also then have the APIs that link these, these bits and pieces together. So I hope this somehow answered the question I have in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot again for uh, your presentation.